Welcome to the Folk Music Academy. I'm Ross Holmes, and today we're going to talk about how to sound grassy. When I mean grassy, I'm not talking about bovines chomping on beautiful green grass in the Swiss Alps. No, I'm talking about how to sound like a bluegrass fiddle player, in case anybody was wondering. <laughs> how to sound grassy. This is um, such a personal experience playing bluegrass music. There are so many different regions of bluegrass players here in the States. Um, so many different iconic fiddle players that have contributed for decades to this genre and all the other genres that connect up to it. Um, it's really a great opportunity for all of us pursuing bluegrass music to find our own individual voices. Um, and I say voices plural because we, I think it's important as, as musicians in this age, this era, to speak multiple different languages uh, and to speak, speak them relatively fluently. I think it's important. And our bluegrass voice is just one of them. But it's fun to get into the authentic side of it. So as I've mentioned in a couple other lessons in this series, there are a few specific things that we can do to sound bluegrassy right out of the get-go. Those are double stops, slides, runs, grace notes, even how we approach the scale. So bluegrass music um, has been around or has been known as bluegrass music since the 1940s when Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys uh, Kentucky boys, um, Kentucky is known as the Bluegrass State, and they performed on the Grand Ole Opry, the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville in 1946. And it was an historic moment because after that performance that night at the Grand Ole Opry, bluegrass music was born. Um, we actually have a date and a time. It's pretty incredible. Most genres of music kind of trickle back through the ages and connect however they do. and we actually have a marker, a point in time, a physical place, a stage you can still stand on to this day. It's pretty cool. But within bluegrass music, as it grew and spread through the decades and made its way around the world, everybody sort of developed their sound, their interpretation of how it should go. What we're going to do, I'm going to teach you a really quick, simple fiddle tune uh, called Boil the Cabbage. It's, I'll, pl I'll play it for you. You probably already know it. Check it out. Super simple. If you don't know it, now you do. We're going to use Boil the Cabbage as sort of our medium for how to sound grassy. So I mentioned double stops. Well, of course, with something uh, like a basic melody where you've got one note. Play the third with it. Technically, when you got down to the first finger and played open E, that was a fourth, but <laughs> you get the point. Um, in bluegrass, as I mentioned before, we can utilize parallel fifths. So they're a very, very specific sound, a very specific flavor. They can be overdone in the most beautiful way. Some players just use them all the time, and it's part of their signature sound. Um, you can use them sparingly. You don't ever have to use them, but in bluegrass, you'll often hear them on all the classic recordings. It's a stylistic choice, uh, as well as uh, a harmonic choice. So in Boil the Cabbage, we can play parallel fifths like this. And what I did there, as well as playing the fifths, I used a really big slide. Instead of playing I took my second finger and I slid it down to that first finger, the fifth, the B and the F sharp. It's just a little tiny detail, but those details really do add to the to the larger sound, the bigger thing that we're saying. So 
That's an example of a double stop, an example of a slide. Uh, let's add a run and maybe a grace note. Those are just a few ideas. Playing around the different passing chords is a wonderful thing. Um, you know, when you're playing, uh, without going too far into theory, but as you're going from your one chord, in this case, A major. If you play the seventh note, the G, to get up to your D chord, which is when we get to this note. So A is here. D chord. A. E. You know the key of A, that's your one, your four, and your five. Different inversions, the different scale degrees, bringing you through the changes of the chords. Um, we can use the passing chords, for example, that G note that we're adding is the, the dominant, it's the, the flat seven of the one, and that feeds nicely into the four. Then I lowered the, the third of the D, the F sharp, down to an F natural to make that almost like a D minor. I'm just playing a bunch of different options for double stops, different, different chord versions like the E, which adds the the seven, the flat seven of the E chord, the D note, into the mix and gives a little bit of attitude, a pop of color of sound. There are so many options for, for how to do this. One of the uh, often neglected points that um, presenters forget to share is just how important the bow is. We could sit and talk literally for hours about different patterns to play, different approaches to slurring, um, whether two note slurs or four note slurs or three note slurs work best to produce a fluid sound. But the most important thing to remember with bluegrass is that when you listen, these players, at least to my ear, all sound so smooth and so consistent. There's an equitability between all of the notes that they, they have the same value, the same quality. And yes, dynamics are used and they're used very well. Uh, different bowing approaches are used and used very well from chopping to spiccato or ricochet playing. Um, so many uh, bowing techniques that bluegrass players may, may not even know the proper name for. It's just a tool that they use, a trick that they use. Uh, the biggest thing is how consistent and smooth the sound is. It's not choppy, it's very fluid. So if we look at boil the cabbage, one of the, one of the ways that I like to really practice this, like everything else, is, is slowly, but when you record yourself, voice memo on your phone, or if you have a fancier setup studio in your house, when you record yourself and listen back, it's sort of like athletes watching game tapes and replays. They learn from their mistakes, they recognize their strengths and push those as well as the areas that they need to improve. And smooth bowing is one of the easiest things to identify if it's a point that you need to work on. And it's really just sitting and playing the melody and trying to get this, the notes to have the same value, a smooth, even consistency. That's what creates the pulse within bluegrass music. And while that, while other genres uh, really rely on the bow to, to, to drive a specific and pointed rhythm, maybe it's uh, a jig or, or something in 6-8 or 9-8 uh, in Celtic music that requires a really specific punch on the downbeat, bluegrass music, oddly, through the, the smooth bowing, 
creates its own drive. There's its own pulse there. Uh, so those are a few things to think about, a few ideas for you to take and practice on your own with any of the tunes in this lesson series or any tunes that, that you want to try. I also think it's a great experiment to take songs from other genres and try to make them sound bluegrassy or take bluegrass tunes and maybe try to make them sound like melodies from a different genre of music as well. That does nothing but strengthen our creativity, strengthen our hand, our bow control, our left hand control, the tone that we're making. There's nothing but, but a positive experience um, inside of all of that focus and all of that practice. So to sound grassy, uh, that's how you do it unless you decide to move to uh, Kentucky right up the road from me here in Nashville and really get into uh, horses and bourbon. I guess that would make you a, a bluegrass, real true bluegrass fan. <laughs> Uh, cool. That was really fun.